And so I work with Fathers Incorporated, um, started in 2004. Um, we are now going on 18 years of work in the responsible fatherhood field. Uh, for the last year and a half, we have been uh, honored to also um, have a fire grant here in Metro Atlanta um, to serve 900 dads over the next five years. Uh, we did really well in the first year. Uh, we were targeted to serve 100 fathers in the first year. Uh, we actually served 141. Um, the roles in terms of the individuals that are coming into our space continue to um, continue to grow. Um, we were able to, within the short window of recruitment between um, uh, April of 2021 um, to September 2021, we were able to pull close to 800 fathers into our ecosystem, uh, to which we serve in our curriculums, 141 of them, but provided um, other services to the other um, gentlemen that were a part of our program. And now that we are now beginning into our uh, first, second year um, of this grant, uh, we have a graduation that is coming up in two weeks to which we are graduating. Uh, wow, the number just jumped out of my head. I believe it's, I believe it's 50, I believe it's 58. I believe the number is 58. We have 58 fathers graduating um, in, in two weeks, um, a new cohort starting in three weeks to which we have over 50 fathers, new fathers in that cohort. So we will um, have served half of our number um, by the time we get out of uh, March in terms of our goal of 200 for this first year. So we're excited about that. This work that we um, started with um, the Monaghan Institute began a year ago. Um, if you go to our website at fathersincorporated.com, you can read all about um, the uh, research initiative that we have begun and the rationale for the work that we're doing. On the screen now, you will see um, our fellows um, that um, is led today by Dr. Jeff Shears, and he will talk more about um, himself and the work that we're doing. Um, but I'll talk just a couple of seconds about the reasoning for Fathers Incorporated to get into the research space. Um, and it was really stimulated um, off of something that um, I heard my colleague, and you're going to hear from him today, um, speak as well. Um, They go, and it has become the inspiration for really um, the creation of, of, of telling our own story. When I say our, I mean the story of Black fathers and Black families, and how do we begin to control the narrative of what is said about Black families, and more specifically, Black fathers, what is researched, how we research them, um, how we articulate what we research, how we disseminate what we research and how we frame um, what we research. And basically it's grounded in the African proverb um, that paraphrasing says, as long as the hunter is writing the story, the lion, the story of the lion will never be told. And so the creation of the Moynihan Institute for Fatherhood Research and Policy was about the lion taking control of his story and telling the story the way it should be told based on um, what we know um, about specifically Black fathers in this space. The reason for um, calling it the Moynihan Institute. And a lot of folks have said, well, you know, why did you name it that? You know, you could have named it after a great Black researcher or a prominent Black researcher. And we um, thought about that long and hard. I thought about it long and hard um, and said, yeah, we could have, you know, but my experience is when you play, pay those kinds of tributes in this space, um, no one 
pays attention to you and no one pays attention. It's a great honor, but it doesn't allow us to command the space where people are actually paying attention and legitimizing the work that we're trying to do. And what I know about the Monaghan Institute is the name Monaghan is a lightning rod. And so if I call it the Monaghan, if we call ourselves the Monaghan Institute, it would get your attention. You would pay attention to us and you would pay attention to the work. And as we use the name Monaghan, we are not referencing or speaking to the man, Senator Monaghan. We're speaking more specifically to the Monaghan report. That is where our work is stimulated for because um, and an argument could be made um, about that particular report. But to be honest with you, in the research space, in the statistic place, in the um, framing space um, for black families in this country, the foundation and spark plug for where most of those conversations begin is in the Negro report, which is commonly known as the Monaghan report. And so it has been our task to really use that as a foundational gauge to spring from, because while pundits uh, may not agree with the individual that engaged in the research and or even some of the findings in the research, Many people will end with the caveat, well, in a very ironic way, most of what he said became true. And so you can connect some of those things um, to the report, which we do, but we have a very even conversation about why uh, we got engaged in this work and why we have attached our work, at least the genesis of our work to that particular report. And if you wanna know more about um, in depth in why we did that and some of our rationale, go to our website at fathersincorporated.com and you will see the last webinar that we did called Why the Monaghan Institute. And that's about an hour and a half of our fellows really taking a deep dive into why we use the Monaghan Institute for Fatherhood Research and Policy. And so our speakers today, um, let me introduce to you um, Dr. Jeff Shears. Um, he is a joint appointed professor in the social work department at North Carolina A&T State University, as well as the University for North Carolina Greensboro, where he is also the director of the joint master's social work program. Dr. Shears earned his BSW and master's in education administration from North Carolina A&T State University and his PhD in social work from the University of Denver. His interest, his research interest is in men, um, fathering, multicultural issues, HIV and AIDS, and quantitative research with an emphasis on data sharing among social service agencies. And then I wanna to introduce to you Dr. Armand Perry, um, who is a professor and a director of the BSW program at the University for Louisville's Kent School of Social Work. Dr. Perry teaches introduction to social work. He also has research interests that include father's involvement in the lives of their children, leading him to co-edit Fatherhood in America, Social Work Perspectives in a Changing Society, a comprehensive edited volume addressing the micro and macro factors shaping paternal involvement. Currently, Dr. Perry serves as the principal investigator for the For Your Child Program, a federally funded multi-site project that aims to increase non-resident fathers' capacity for paternal involvement. In addition to that, his teaching and research, Dr. Perry has professional experience in the areas of child protective services, as well as parent education curriculum facilitator. And last but certainly not least, uh, my brother and good friend, David Miller, um, who is the CEO and Chief Visionary Officer of Dare to Be King. Um, he is a Baltimore native and has received international acclaim for the Dare to Be King, What If a Prince Lives, a survival workbook for African-American males, a thought-provoking 52-week curriculum teaching adolescent males how to survive and thrive in toxic environments. On with his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Baltimore and a master's degree in education from Gulcher College, Miller frequently leads conversations with men and boys focused on boyhood, fatherhood, parenting, mental health, managing anger, decision-making, and alternatives to violence. 
Miller has provided extensive training for juvenile justice, youth development, and mentoring organizations in the U.S. and abroad. And I'm also happy to say that in short order, um, he is now a doctoral candidate, and we will soon be adding the preface to Mr. David Miller's name as Dr. Um, David Miller, and I'm so proud of him. We've watched him in his journey get to that. That is an awesome, awesome accomplishment. And so I turn it over um, to Dr. Jeff Shears. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kenny, for the introductions. Uh, again, kudos to Kenny Bradswell, Fathers Incorporated, for launching the Moynihan Institute. Um, I know Kenny and I had conversations long, long time ago about uh, the need to um, get a cadre of scholars to address the needs of fathering in the black community. And um, so kidding again, kudos to you to allow uh, this, this group of scholars to come together to start looking at topics that are near and dear to our hearts, near and dear to people who look like, uh, like us, near and dear to people who are relatives of us and near and dear to neighborhoods and, and experiences that we've had. And so uh, yeah, kudos to you, my man. Um, Super glad to be on this panel today with some fellow social workers. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, as you heard, the introduction is a common thread. Uh, and so we want to um, talk about the study, uh, the experiences and needs of Atlanta's young MPUV fathers. Um, and the rationale for the study was really to understand, explore um, fathers and their ability to contribute to children's well-being. So what is it like growing up in some of these neighborhoods that are uh, largely African-American, uh, largely low-income? Uh, what supports do men have? How do they feel uh, in being supported as fathers in these communities? And just what is, what is it their, their lived experiences in being fathers in certain communities? Uh, go to the next slide for me, Ken. So today I'm going to just talk about um, the kind of scientific uh, research methodology piece of the study. And uh, Armand and David are going to talk a little bit about the policy implications in addition to what we found when we had these, uh, this, these conversations with men in this community. And so uh, the geographical units, the MPUV community, which is uh, in Atlanta, great in a large urban area of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, as I mentioned before, it is a highly concentrated population of low-income, single, female-headed households. And so we offer you a map, and a little bit later, I should tell, tell you the uh, zip codes that constitute the MPUV community. Next slide, Ken. So it's super important to understand lived experiences from um, people who live in, as I say, largely minority communities, largely African-American communities. And so uh, we had three focus groups, um, which totaled a sample of 13 fathers who identified as African-Americans. Um, they had some relationship with the MPUV community. So either they lived there, they worked there, or they played in the community. Um, the children of these men who participate in the study uh, range from unborn, unborn children to 17 years old. The average age of, of the child of the children were 3.53 years. So these were all fathers and the average age of the children were right about three and a half years. So most of these men had really young children, even though as you see the ranges, we had a couple of teenagers, but most of these men had really young children. So these are young fathers with young children. A lot of these were new dads. Uh, we use a purpose of sampling protocol of men who were interested in, in talking with us. And as you can see on the screen, it has the zip codes that we used uh, that these guys reported that they lived in. Um, and in order to get our sample, we partnered with some neighborhood churches, barbershop, community centers, had things on social media, and then the Fathers Incorporated database to, um, as again, purpose of sample. So we are not going to generalize with this, the findings of the study because we use a purpose of sample but it does give us a snapshot and give us some in-depth information about uh, what guys are experiencing in these communities in regards to uh, what they feel they need as fathers. Next slide, Next slide Ken. All right, so uh, we had a focus groups and we of course did this through um, 
COVID. And so we were unable to meet in person, but we had um, um, well-involved focus groups online and using Zoom. And so we had semi-structured questions. So within each of the three focus groups, we had semi-structured questions, which simply means that all these guys were asked an initial question. And then based on the interviewer, um, they might have been asked um, some slightly different follow-up questions, but we all started with the same questions that every group member will ask. Um, and so the questions that we asked were, regarding the MPUV community, what do men need to be an impactful father? So part of this was kind of do, what, what do guys feel like they need? A lot of times we feel like the government and the community uh, is responsible for that. But, you know, what do these men feel like they need to be an impactful father? And then we asked them, what have your experiences as a father been in the MPUV, in your community? Um, how has your affiliation with this community enhanced or limited your ability to do your job as a father? We know there are several different uh, things that either support us as fathers or inhibit us as fathers. And so living in these communities or this, this community in particular, what enhanced or limited your ability to do your job as a dad? A uh, really important question was what community supports are available um, to help you do your job and navigate your job as a father? Um, and I've tried desperately paired Armand trying not to get into the responses. So I'm going to stay with the questions. <laughs> I'm already thinking about responses as I read the questions. But, you know, there again, it's super important to understand the perception, right? Um, the perception of these guys, these young dads, and what supports were available to them. And then the the big question at the end was what additional community supports are needed for fathers in your community? What additional supports are needed? Next slide, Ken. All right, so the um, after we gathered data, uh, we, we recorded and then transcribed the data. Um, so we recorded all of the interviews and transcribed the data verbatim. Um, and then we had, um, went back and coded the focus groups to really see what emerged in regards to concepts and themes, uh, just general uh, qualitative data analyses. We use a comparative method for qualitative analysis. We identified the different concepts that the data showed us. We looked at frequency and distribution of concepts, how often people said things, uh, tried to really get a, 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 uh, a concentration of what guys were saying. You know, what were things, what were the things that come out of focus groups that guys were saying continuously and use those to uh, incorporate those things in a conceptual framework. Uh, next slide, Ken. All right, to ensure reliability and accuracy uh, results of the coding, we use a research team of African-American males um, and we met and documented the data and then we cross-check those codes, what one person found. We all look at the data individually, then collectively came together to uh, identify any gaps in data and to make sure that we were all seeing the same things and reading the same things from the transcripts. So uh, from a qualitative data analysis standpoint, uh, we did all the checks and, and, and things to make sure we had good reliability, validity, or as we say in, in qualitative research, trustworthiness of the data. All right, Ken. All right, so I'm gonna, um, that's kind of the boring piece about how we collected data, all of the kind of qualitative research methodology, methodology that was used to um, gather data for the focus groups. And I wanna turn it to the probably more interesting part um, to Dr. Perry to talk about what fathers expressed and what the results of the um, questions were. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I get the, the, the pleasure of being able to share with you uh, some of the findings from the, the interviews and the, the focus groups. And, and I should say that this, this work, I think, is really, really important work. And like my co-panelists have mentioned, I think should be uh, commended because the, the results and the, the findings, I think, will dovetail quite nicely from a qualitative standpoint, providing that in-depth perspective, that nuanced perspective that oftentimes gets left on the table when you're only doing survey research. And so I think that the way that these findings will uh, corroborate and complement the, the, the evaluation data that 
uh, Kenny and the crew are gathering from their, uh, their, their fatherhood grants, I think will be really, really powerful and impactful. The reason why we uh, wanted to be specific and intentional about the, these focus groups is because we wanted to zero in on a specific subpopulation of Atlanta. And so um, when you think about the city of Atlanta, Atlanta is known for a, a number of things, but um, we also know Atlanta to be a place where there are a lot of economic opportunities and uh, Atlanta is essentially the capital of the South and is a place where people go to seek out um, economic opportunities. And so if you don't really know, you could walk away with the misconception that everything is, uh, Atlanta is a land of milk and honey. And for many it is, but for others it isn't. And that's particularly true for fathers who find themselves connected to and affiliated in communities like the MPUV. And so we wanted to take a, a closer nuanced look at what fathering looked like for them and the circumstances surrounding how it is that they were trying to navigate that. So the, uh, the, the themes from the transcripts that uh, were most salient and, and emerged from us as, as most salient, the first of which you're seeing here, which is this idea of fathering and fear. And with, with fathering and fear, we aren't talking about people being afraid to be fathers. So like, don't take that literally. What we're talking about is this sense that many of the dads that we talked to had concerns about whether or not they were gonna have access to the supports and the capacity that they needed to be able to handle the rigors of parenting, right? So we know that fathering and particularly non-resident fathering necessarily requires economic resources. It requires support resources, both human capital and social capital. And that wasn't available to a lot of the guys that we talked to and it caused them a lot of concern. Um, and I've given a lot of thought to this. And if I can just sort of share with you a, a brief analogy that I think will resonate with many of you all. When we talk about this idea of fear and fathering, fathers again express those concerns about fatherhood and whether or not they want to have access. They talked about the lack of role models in and around their immediate, if I can use Kenny, Kenny's word, ecosystem, right? And some of the barriers from both a uh, lack of resource standpoint, oftentimes from a public policy standpoint, uh, things that sort of stood in their way, right, for keeping them from sort of uh, uh, acting on their intentions to be more active and involved fathers. And it was also the case that they cited the lack of formal education as another barrier to their financial stability, which was part and parcel to them carrying out their roles as, as involved fathers. And when I've given thought to this, what, I, what I've envisioned is, you know how when, if you're at home, right, and, and you wake up in the middle of the night and the electricity is out. But if you're at home, even in the pitch black, you can still mostly navigate your way around your house, right? You can, you can make your way to the bathroom if you needed to, or you can make your way to the front door, even in the pitch black because of your familiarity with your surroundings. But I'm reminded of a situation when I first moved to Louisville and my grandmother came to visit me. She got up in the middle of the night, she had to go to the bathroom, and we literally found her frozen in the corner the next morning. Like she could not move. She was afraid that she was going to take a misstep and she was going to fall down the stairs and end up in the basement. Right. And it was that lack of familiarity with her surroundings that it literally paralyzed her. And I think that's what the guys are talking about when they talk about this sort of fear of fathering. It's the, again, the lack of role models, it's the lack of resources, and they don't have the support around them. And so they find themselves unable to move, right? And for many of us, what we do is we talk so much about the stigma. If we can move to the next slide, please. We talk so much about the stigma that's associated with, with Black fathering. And the guys are familiar with this, and they're aware of all of the discourse, and they're aware of all of the discussion and the conversation that surrounds them and all the negativity that's pointed at black fathers for what they either are or aren't doing, what they can or cannot do. What ends up happening is we don't spend enough time talking about the extent to which these guys have access to the resources that they need to get done what we all want them to get done. Meanwhile, um, it's also true for them that uh, other people, particularly mothers, have large numbers of resources available to them. And it's not about a comparison, it's not about a finger pointing, but it's about a simple awareness of resource uh, availability. Um, and when we're talking about for fathers, that's just simply not there. And specifically and particularly when we're talking about fathers who live in 
socially, politically, and economically disadvantaged communities like the dads that we talk to, there's just simply uh, not the capacity available to them to help them uh, in, in handling the rigors of, of parenting. And so that stigma that we all know was there, the guys are familiar with that. They, they know that, they're familiar with it. Many of them, unfortunately, have internalized it, but they also work to try to refute it and reject it as best they can. And so we know that, uh, just as Kenny mentioned early on, when he was talking about the narrative and trying to take control of the narrative and, 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 and re-envision the narrative. A lot of the guys that we talked to, they were cognizant of that and they were working with whatever uh, available resources they had. Sometimes the only resource they had was each other, right? And the fatherhood program that they were, were involved in. But they were trying to leverage those resources the best they could. And many of them would express intention on uh, recreating the narrative or taking ownership of the narrative so as to not contribute to whatever that stigma is. And so we see some of that played out in this discussion or this theme surrounding the idea of stigma associated with, with Black fatherhood. Next slide, please. So we've also been alluding to uh, the, the issue of supportive services was a major issue. Um, and when so those of us in the field of human and social services you may be familiar with a concept known as asset mapping where you sort of look at a geographical space and you try to make determinations about what is available to people from a social service standpoint from an educational standpoint from an economic standpoint and we know that in in many of these communities those resources just simply are not there but we also know from asset mapping that there's also this notion of intangible assets, right? And these are things like uh, pride in one's community or community connectedness. And when the fathers were talking to us about the support services that were available to them, most of what they talked about in terms of what was available had to do with this sense of community and the, the pride that they took in being from the neighborhood and from the community, the ways in which they could lean on one another uh, resources limited as they were, they could lean on one another to try to help them sort of get through. And that's where I think the the importance and the salience of programs like the ones that our Fathers Incorporated are providing in communities like these are so important because, again, absent those programs, then there's a void or a vacuum in terms of what may be available specifically to dads and specifically to fathers. And so the guys were able to talk to us in really, really clear terms about how it was that they were aware of what was or wasn't available to them and how when Fathers Incorporated showed up in the space with resources and with opportunities for them, those things that they were eager to take advantage of. Next slide, please. And then again, we, we wrap up with a discussion related to navigating fatherhood. Uh, and again, as we were mentioning early on, Despite the, the challenges that the dads face, we know that they have uh, interest in being as active as they can be in their kids' lives. We know that they were striving to be positive forces in their children's lives. We know that they were simultaneously looking to be present in a physical sense, but also have a presence in their children's lives that transcended whether or not they were physically around and for how often it was they were physically around, because again, when we're talking about non-resident fatherhood, you necessarily have to think about the extent to which dads have access to their children. And that's not something that they necessarily have volitional control over because they have to negotiate access, usually with the custodial parent. And sometimes issues related to co-parenting and the dissolution of their romantic relationship gets in the way. Sometimes family court serves as a barrier. Uh, sometimes, and I think uh, not to step on Kenny's toes or, or, or to steal some of his thunder, but when we get into issues related to legitimation and the differences between being a non-resident dad who's non-resident as a result of a divorce versus being non-resident as a result of having never been married. The courts treat those people completely different and uh, that has implications for the extent to which dads can maintain access. So like dads talked about having to navigate all of those types of situations, not to mention uh, doing all of this in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that uh, sent many of them away from their work and, and, and severely limited their ability to provide for their children while at the same time having to deal with a child support system that in many ways was uh, unable or unwilling in some cases to make modifications to awards and so on and so forth. So, uh, so again, so for all of those reasons, the fathers were extremely grateful for uh, the work that Fathers Incorporated, particularly with the General uh, Warriors program was doing in being sort of a, an oasis uh, in, in, in an otherwise sort of desert of supportive services 
available to fathers. And so we, we want to, again, commend them for the work that they're doing and also salute those dads for trying to remain resilient in the face of large numbers of barriers and challenges that they face in order to take active roles in their children's lives. If I'm not mistaken, there is a report available where you can see some of the, the quotes and specific quotes there that I think I, I think were really, really powerful and impactful as the guys were able to sort of narrate their own narratives and talk to us about the ways in which their lived experiences were impacted by the types of questions we were asking and the ways in which those things played out in their lives. So I would encourage all of you all, if you've not seen that, to get a copy of it and really let, allow it to inform the work that you're doing in whatever part of the country where you are. I think that's all of the slides that I have. Hey, I, I want to, uh, before we go to uh, David, I just want to interject three thoughts. And thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Dr. Perry. Uh, so one of the things that certainly resonated in what we found in just in the findings piece was um, the sense kind of goes against maybe common perception, the sense that these low-income African-American men in this community uh, they want to be good dads. So that was, you know, we think about one of the first things that you talked about. They really wanted to be good dads. It was the intent to be a good father, uh, even maybe in their limited exposure to good fathering, because that kind of goes to our one of the second points was that um, mentors and, and models, role models that were not available to them. We think about how do men learn how to father uh, we know that the biggest influence on men fathering is usually their own fathers and then it's relatives and friends and then it's community. Um, and then, uh, then the last um, influence is media. We kind of put those things in hierarchy there. So fathers, relatives, communities and media. And so, um, you know, these guys will be heavily influenced by the media because they're saying that, you know, they don't have things in their community as models. They may not have relatives or family members and they may not have had fathers. And so um, that really goes to show where the areas of needs are, at least the way they express and um, what a voice were in them being good fathers. They clearly articulated early on. They want to be good fathers. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up. They will go to you about policy, but the whole economic piece too, um, the continual pressure and responsibilities and things that we put on fathers to be providers. Um, now, we know that is one of our roles, but, you know, a lot of times um, men take on that as the most important or the main role and not really. And so that pressure of economics and financial stability or whatever uh, just really falls into that role as provider. We really have to make sure we expand that as we talk to fathers too, that that's not your only role is just to provide, but it is really to be engaged and be interactive with your children. So um, just uh, Dr. Armand, uh, appreciate it. Great job and talk about findings. David, we're going to uh, switch it over to you and talk about policy implications, please. And thank you. If, if I could, I'm sorry, David, before you get into that, I, I think, again, I think what you just said, this idea of that fathers are more than providers. I think that, again, that underscores the importance and the salience of the fatherhood programs like the Gentle Warriors, right? Because we all know that, but it's something else for the dads to, to, to see that and to understand that and appreciate that. But it's even more because we need platforms and forms like this where we can reach out to practitioners who can carry that message in whatever parts of the country they're in. Because some of this about narrative is about us changing that so that we understand and people place value on dads involved in, in getting involved in that nurturing and caregiving work so that people see value in it. Uh, and then, then it's also the case that uh, given that that's not something that we stereotypically get from a socialization standpoint, then uh, and once we place value on it, understand the importance of it, now it's about making sure that people have access to quality skill building opportunities where they can practice those things before they can actually apply them in their families of origin. So again, really, really important work here. Really just the tip of the iceberg, looking forward for more to come. Uh, I'm sorry for, for interrupting. Uh, soon to be Dr. Miller, go ahead and do your thing. No, thank you. And we can bring up the next slide. And I think many of the things that you guys have shared are, are critically important. And we encourage all that are participating in the, in the webinar this morning, this afternoon, depending upon where, what city you may be in, go to fathersincorporated.com and, and actually uh, download the report, uh, because I think we really did a good job of capturing um, many of the salient points that, that uh, again, low-income young dads in the city of Atlanta, 
oftentimes don't necessarily have an opportunity to share or talk about. And as Dr. Perry talked about, uh, there was a theme, this theme of I want to be a good father was something that we heard over and over again as we analyzed the, um, the focus groups, this, this yearning to be a good father, even in situations where I may or may not have had a good father or father figure, and I'm constantly being bombarded by these negative depictions of Black fatherhood, I want to be a good father um, rang throughout uh, the focus groups, and you'll see it uplifted in the report. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to handle the policy implications section. And then I know Kenny has some questions for the panelists. But we begin, we, we really encourage you to think about questions or comments that you may have. And you, be, you can actually begin to populate uh, the chat with those questions or comments. As it relates to the policy implications, uh, one of the larger policy implications is how do we begin to support fathers and, and leverage uh, and increase their parenting capacity. One of the things that we do know is that the dads that we interview want to be good fathers, but they need support. And in order for us to be able to provide that kind of support, we need to be able to develop more grassroots, community-based uh, workforce investment programs, fatherhood programs that are, that are community-based, as, as well as being able to look deeply into the lives of these fathers um, allow these fathers to have their own voice so we can so we can really begin to leverage the human capacity and we can begin to scale up in terms of skills and resources for these dads. The next uh, policy implications, a deeper analysis of the Georgia law on legitimation process for unmarried fathers. The current legitimation policy really puts unmarried dads at risk of not having uh, their children or a legal say in, the, in some of those critical decisions that are made. And then also looking at how oftentimes these dads begin to get deeper and deeper into financial debt. And so this issue around the legitimation process in Georgia is, is really a, a bigger one. And there's uh, Fathers Incorporated has actually done a video and Kenny is gonna show you a slide where you can actually access that video to get more information about the impact that the legitimation process is having, particularly on low-income Black fathers in the state of Georgia. The, the, legitimate, the, legitimate, the legitimation process, excuse me, negatively impacts low-income fathers. However, more disproportionately, I mean, it impacts fathers in general, but we find disproportionately Black fathers are, um, are impl 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 impacted, excuse me, at a lot, by a larger degree of any other fathers in the state of Georgia. And so those are our three overarching uh, policy implications. And now we'll go to q and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kenny. I think Kenny has some additional questions. Yeah. And so thank you so much um, for all of that information. And thank you for um, your work in helping us create um, this narrative. And I also wanna take a moment to thank um, the Annie Casey um, Foundation, um, Atlanta Civic Site. Um, led by um, Kwaku uh, Fortstall here in Atlanta, who um, seeded our ability to be able to create this report and has supported us in other areas of our work here in Atlanta. Um, and so we will continue to dig down um, here in Atlanta in the work that we're doing. And Dr. Perry said something that I wanted to make another connection to and bring back up. And that is the fact that we do have a direct service grant here in Atlanta. And so it really allows us to be on the ground um, to see this work um, firsthand, to deal and talk with these fathers firsthand, to have these fathers call us to, to work in tandem um, with the mothers of their children and their children themselves and really get to hear almost on a minute to minute basis from these guys. My um, navigators and my case manager will tell you that they get phone calls from our fathers at all times of the night, all times of the afternoon, all times of the morning, 
with whatever issues they may be going through um, at the moment. And so um, the work is real for us here as it is so for so many organizations around the country who are trying to find a way to better serve dads, but more specifically in this case, um, Black fathers. The other thing I wanted to raise up is our relationship with um, Redefine Ed, who is also funding us here in Atlanta to provide um, reports in other areas as it relates to education and Black men and Black fathers. And I'll talk to you um, after the Q&A portion about those reports and some of that work as well. And then lastly, and just as important, <clears throat> our relationship with Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball Players Association, who have also funded us to really do a deeper dive in the area of mental health and Black fathers here in Atlanta. And so we are really trying to um, create a foundation that allows us to uh, reframe the narrative of Black fathers and how we see Black fathers and how we work with Black fathers and how we succeed in getting flat Black fathers to meet. Um, I love what Dr. Perry said about, and I, and I put a note down to this because it's something that I scream all the time. And, you know, there's one thing to create programs that enable and build the capacity of fathers to meet their responsibilities. But it's another area of work to help them meet our expectations. Those two things are very and distinctly different their responsibilities and our expectations of them because far too often our expectations of them is to be perfect quite honest with you and even if that's not your intention for them that is how they translate what you're saying to them because they believe that if they're not doing everything right they're not doing anything right. And we hear that day to day from fathers who are trying to meet unrealistic expectations from all corners of society, from their own friends, from their children, to their spouses, to their family, to their community, to the media. And we all have these expectations of what we believe Black a Black father should be based on the negative narrative that we feed from. And, and, and that's a larger conversation that we also have to have. And the other thing that Dr. Perry said was about this whole notion of intangible assets, right? So how do we get our fathers to believe and understand that their value extends beyond the amount of money that they have in their pockets, right? Or the amount of things that they, the tangible things that we believe they should be contributing to their families, but may not have the ability to do that. And how do we translate those conversations to their fathers? That is a part of the work that quite frankly, doesn't get funded, right? And so a lot of things in our work get funded, right? We get funded to help them find a job. We get funded to help them with a life coach. We get funded to help them navigate the child support system. We get funded to help them with housing. We get funded to help them in all these other areas. But it's in that intangible place that that language doesn't show up in grants. It doesn't show up in the work that has to be done that is more often the most critical work that needs to be done. Hurt people can't do anything for anybody else but hurt, Right. And a lot of these guys come to our space extremely hurt, in pain, dejected, and oftentimes not knowing which way is up. And they need someone to help them find their true north. So I just kind of wanted to add those. And then lastly, also wanted to elevate the work of Dr. Latrice Rollins, um, who was at the Morehouse School of, of Medicine, um, who was actually, congratulations, been charged with creating the, I believe it's called the African American Center for Research and Policy, a uh, research, I think is what it's called, it's out of um, OCS, OC, OPRE um, or OCSE out of the federal government to really look at um, how black families and children in particular are being impacted around the country. And so we're excited about that work and we're excited to add um, to that conversation, the conversation that we're trying to stimulate around 
fatherhood and more specifically black men. And so before we go into Q&A, again, if any of you um, who are on the line have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. We will give folks the ability to come on and ask, answer questions. But I have a couple of questions for the panel that I want to um, have them answer, particularly because many of them or all of them are from other areas of the country um, and know how this work looks um, in cities in North Carolina and, and in, um, in, in, in Louisville and, and, and in Baltimore and D.C. And, and Chicago and Miami and Dallas and New York. Of what you've seen um, of the fathers here in Atlanta, where do you see similarities of what black fathers are dealing with in other urban centers around the country. Hey, uh, Ken, this is Jeff. I don't see anything um, you. I don't see anything unique about uh, particular demographic profiles of, of the population we just studied. Like, I don't see anything unique. I think this is consistent. Now, we can't, as researchers, right? We can't prove it. We can kind of mirror this study in other places. But uh, my sense and working in the community and working with uh, other researchers and working with fathering groups, both in Greensboro, where I'm working with a group now, and in Charlotte, where I reside, um, the issues that were expressed and, it's, and the similarities are, I mean, they just support what, what I find. Like, if you don't have support, there are these expectations that we can't meet, we don't have support, and that men want to be good dads. Now, good we have to operationalize good because good is coming from your own experiences and things of that nature. But in a sense, men want to be good fathers. And I, I just thought that was really important that, you know, um, society thinks that given, you know, this demographic profile or whatever, these, these guys want to be good fathers. And if we provide them with the necessary supports, if someone asks a question on here, I think Pam asked a question, how do we get social work and human services to, to be better supports of fathers? So part of it is the understanding that we have to change this whole mindset of children, youth, and families, and that um, you know, social worker, female dominated profession, that we need to embrace the importance of the fathering roles in families, right? And so I'm I'm, I'm about to go on a whole little tangent here, but I just want to say from my, from I'm about to go down this whole other road, Dave. So, but mm -hmm. I just want us to realize that that what we saw in Atlanta, man, is just not some anomaly, right? It's just it's not this little thing happening in Atlanta in isolation. I mean, guys talk about this stuff in, in these communities all over the country, I would imagine. And and thanks. I, and, and I would also add, you know, Kenny, um, you hear these themes across the country, not just with the sample in Atlanta. Um, one of the themes that I think comes out uh, that is really relevant and timely is, is really the anger and frustration and how that anger and frustration, you know, really builds to the point where many times, oftentimes these dads end up making very bad decisions because of the lack of support that they receive, you know, because oftentimes as a young father, they don't, they are not able to get uh, connected to the kinds of support services that they need, whether it's economic, whether it's educational, whether it's workforce development, skill building, then many times these young dads end up in the criminal justice system because of their overwhelming frustrations, fear, and anxiety around trying to be a good dad and even defining what that means, that a lot of times that being a good dad is connected to the money, which often leads these young brothers to go out and break the law which then leads them into a situation of incarceration. Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, somebody, uh, there's so many comments coming in right now, I'm trying to make sure I keep my stream of thought and so that I'm not all over the place. Um, but one of the things um, that one of the individuals brought up was his work, particularly um, behind the walls with our dads um, and what does that work look like specifically for black men without allowing that work to be a lens through which we see all black men, right? And so there's critical work that needs to be done with our men. Here in Atlanta, we um, in the last couple of months have graduated, uh, I believe 17 uh, men in Fulton County Jail through our curriculum and a new cohort is starting this month. And we're also getting ready to do some work 
in Clayton County and have previously done some work in Rockdale. So we're also doing work um, behind the walls with our dads. Um, how critical is that work for these fathers who are coming back into their communities and to their families and children? Oh, Ken, I, <clears throat> Ken, I was responding to it, uh, a question in the chat. And, and so I was, I was trying to multitask and I guess st sort of stereotypically speaking, like, like a lot of men, multitasking clearly is my thing. I think we were all doing that, Perry. I think I was answering the question, Jack. Too sorry, Ken. I heard I heard you <laughs> rolling through work. I heard you reference the work that was happening in it sounds like Metro Atlanta, like Clayton County, and some other places like that. If you if you hit me with the question again, and I the question was how important is it that we do this work um, with our incarcerated dads, and how important oh. and why oh. is that work important? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, so you think about I mean, you think about Michelle Alexander Michelle Alexander's work around mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow and and, and the ways in which from a policy standpoint, the, the implications of uh the, the, the war on drugs and mandatory minimums and and we so we live we live in a country now and I mean this is so wild, right? The way they the way they switch the thing up, the, the bait and switch is so is so crazy in the way in which it negatively impacts black and brown folks. So so you could go you could go to DC and engage in behavior that if you cross North Capitol Street or if you cross the Anacostia River will get you locked up for. Right. Like if, like you can go to Denver, Colorado and be a legitimate businessman by selling weed. You think about how many brothers have been locked up and had their lives turned upside down for engaging in that exact same behavior. And then they decide to change the law. And now that behavior is not only perfectly legitimate, but is in many ways encouraged because of the ways in which it stimulates the economy. You go to California, there's a dispensary on every corner. So anyway, so the, the reason I say that is to say that. When 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 we talk about the reentry work, when we think about the ways in which our communities have been decimated, right, by by mass incarceration, as as guys come home, and not just guys, but again, women are being caught up in this too. But as people start to come home, they have to have opportunities to be able to provide for themselves, right? And so, if and when that doesn't happen, what 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 does happen is Dr. Miller was talking about. Now people use the skills and the resources that they have available to them, and now they're engaged in nefarious behavior that only lands them on the road in terms of recidivism. So again, so being able to serve as a stopgap and help people to, to gain the skills and the capacities to be able to be productive citizens, wherever it is that they're from, I think that's part and parcel to them being able to fulfill their roles as whether it be economic providers, whether it be role models for their children, whether it be role models for their communities. So being involved in work that's happening connected to the, 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 the penal system and the prison system, like nothing, almost nothing could be more important given the implications for the community. And if we're talking specifically about Georgia, Georgia is on the front lines of everything in America because Georgia was essentially Captain America or Iron Man and it basically saved the union from the foolishness that was about to happen during the last election. And we see the reaction to it, right? So, so the rest of the country is also paying attention and they know that Georgia is, the, is on the front line. And so there's an active movement to make sure that people can't vote. And the quickest, most effective and expedient way to make sure that people can't vote is to make sure they get convicted of felonies. Right. And so, again, I, I think the, the work around criminal justice system and criminal justice reform, all of it is connected because all of it ties to those structural barriers that these guys are talking about, how it is that they're faced and the things that keep them from being able to act on their intentions to take active roles in their kids' lives. Thank you so much. We got a great question, um, a research question that I think is relevant. Um, and we certainly have an answer for this one. I love the question. Um, the question is, in, in doing the research beyond COVID and amount of funding, um, what did we learn about reaching and engaging Black fathers? Um, this report is based on 13 fathers. What were your expectations about the number of who would participate and the advice you would give to others in doing similar kinds of reports, particularly with Black fathers? Yeah, so um, so I don't, for this study, and then just in general, so uh, at times it's a little more difficult to engage African-American fathers uh, only because of the historical distrust we have for research. A lot easier to get them engaged when you have a person that looks like them and contact them and they're a lot more comfortable. Um, 
we were shooting for higher numbers, um, but uh, COVID and doing, you know, and just just the the, the day to day issues of getting men scheduled uh, and having them on call with their kids and try, you know, those things just come into play versus, you know, getting folks away from home or whatever. So those things kind of came into play. Um, being able to reach and then using kind of a snowball sampling technique in some, t- in some areas too, where, Hey, give us more guys we can call. Um, the, once you explain to men though, I mean, once you get them on the call, get them on the call and get them in a conversation, explain to them that we really want to hear your voice and your voice and experiences are needed. So, I mean, think about it. A lot of us don't even talk about fathering in other communities and education, you know, in higher income communities or whatever. So you're, you have, you're engaging with this young man who no one has asked him about his feelings about being a dad. No one has asked, you know, and so, um, if you're able to talk with them, which is the, that's the, that's really the big hurdle, the big roadblock is to actually get them to engage in a conversation. But once you get them and explain to them uh, what the study's about, how important their voice is, how important, you know, really how important your role as a dad is and how this can just impact other communities. It's, it's a lot more, it's a lot simpler to get them to, yeah, I'll commit. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to talk to you because no one has ever asked him that before. Um, but yeah, the COVID thing and doing everything virtual, I mean, it had this, this, you know, just in to be honest and transparent, it's had different other, you know, had multiple layers of, of uh, hurdles or whatever in trying to get this, this study completed. But again, and I'm saying this going forward, um, you get in a, a room, a cadre of men talking to uh, either groups of men or men individually, once you get them engaged, these guys want, they want to talk about the experiences because they, you, you start to relate to them how important their experiences are. I hope that's helpful. I, I got the sense from that question, Ken, that someone else like, hey, I'm trying to get in a community. And if you are, I tell you what, it's, it's a lot easier if you, if the person who's contacted them kind of looks like them or has some, some, some street cred in the community, right? That's a, it's a lot easier to get them engaged. And Ken, that, that's actually the question I was responding to when I couldn't hear the, the, the Clayton County sort of thing. <laughs> and, and, and I was trying to come up with a way to, to respond to the question without turning it into like a sort of a research methods thing. But but the other thing that I was I was what I was attempting to type out is <coughs> keep in mind that what Dr. Shears mentioned, when we first started that this th- this presentation is based on a qualitative study. Right. And so so by definition, when you talked about the purpose of sampling, and he talked about the idea that what we weren't looking to do was make generalizations. What he was saying was we wanted to keep this particular sample small because we're looking for a really, really specific type of person. And what we're looking for a really, really specific type of person for is because we know that those people have expertise in the lived experiences that we were looking to illuminate on this presentation. So in other words, if you think about sort of a, a regular survey type thing, like you literally want as many different people as, as is possible, because what you're looking to do is you're necessarily trying to take that information and generalize it to the public. With the qualitative work, you're doing the exact opposite. You're trying to take a small group of people who you have reason to believe have expertise in a very specific type of thing. And that thing that we're looking at, the phenomenon that we're examining with this presentation is the idea of being a black father who lives not just in Atlanta, but a black father who lives in a specific community, right? So again, so we're being really, really detailed and really, really nuanced here because we're looking to go beyond what you might find on a general survey or what you may find in a large data set. So ideally, that's the reason why we were talking about early on that this particular piece of work is a complementary piece to what will happen later on with the larger samples from the work that Fathers Incorporated is doing throughout the community, because then what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to take that quantitative data, that numbers-based data, and then you'll be able to accentuate and highlight the specific nuances that the surveys are gonna miss. So ideally those two things come hand in hand or work hand in hand. And so this was just a small piece of a larger sort of a puzzle. You know, and I wanted to add on to that because I wanna connect a couple of other things um, to exactly what you're talking about. You know, I remember, and I'm going to 
kind of mention very shortly a couple of different things so that you just kind of really understand Fathers Incorporated's um, trajectory here in Atlanta and how we've been able to be so successful in what we're doing currently. Um, I can say to you that that has not always been the case. Um, I remember coming to Atlanta from New York, National Fatherhood Organization, you know, thought I was the it you know, organization in the country and that no matter where I went, they will follow and I could do big things wherever I went. And I remember rolling into Atlanta and we decided we wanted to do a national conference in Atlanta and we were able to get um, Turner Field at the time the Braves were still there. We got Turner Field and we were going to do this big, huge conference at Turner Field and we were going to turn everybody in Atlanta out and we were going to do some this thing really big and um, become we had a, a father festival. We had vendors. It was it was ridiculous. We had all the bells and whistles rolling, and it was crickets. It was it, the only people who supported that particular conference were the people who kind of knew who we were nationally, but we had absolutely no local support because locally no one knew who we were, and that was a big slap in my face. And I took a step back for almost two years just to figure out how do you get more deeply invested in this particular community so that you can do the work on the ground. Fast forward, uh, up until last year, we have continued to, um, for those of you who don't know, Fathers Incorporated also oversees um, and is the prime contractor of the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse as well. And so we also oversee that work throughout the country. But up until a year, a year ago, so ago, when we got the fire grant, we were still basically only doing professional development um, policy and capacity building, really had not dug into doing direct services. And then we began and we got this fire grant and started to do direct services. And the um, strategy was to come in and to elicit fathers in Atlanta to become part of a movement as opposed to sign up for our curriculum. So we created this campaign called Fatherhood is Brotherhood. Many of you have heard this campaign um, work that we're doing. And what we did was we went out to these fathers and what we pitched to them is that we want you to join the brotherhood. We want you to come into the brotherhood. And once you come into the brotherhood, you're going to come into a safe space. And in that safe space, we'll be able to help you, support you, provide for you, guide you and be um, a mentor in the space of fatherhood for you. And it resonated around the city. Um, and we ramped up numbers through our intake form on our website and fathers came in, fathers came in, fathers came in. By this time, we were just really getting started. Um, we had not gotten started with this particular research piece yet. But what has, what has become the product of that work is now that these fathers, to Dr. Shear's point, these fathers are in the quote unquote brotherhood when we ask them to do things for us, like show up to an event, um, support something that we're doing, or even be a participant in a research study, they are now more apt to engage without question because they're now part of a network that they believe that if they, if they engage in this process, that they are contributing to the work that this is not an outside thing that we're asking them to do for a $25 gift card. That once they come in the brotherhood, they are cultivated in the way that everything that you do in your behavior as a father contributes to our work and contributes to building our capacity to serve more fathers in this community. And so now, um, we've had two events with over 100 people at one event, 200 people at another event um, since since October 1 of 2021 to today. We've brought in 350 more dads into our ecosystem for our cohort moving forward. The legitimation process and, and, and serving 
um, fathers in Atlanta through this legitimation, knowing that 75 percent, I believe the number is 75 percent of the fathers who come into our ecosystem have either a legitimation or a child support issue. That's what they're coming to us from. And so we knew we had to serve that element of our fathers in order to get them to come into the brotherhood. So I think that when you're doing research to um, all of our um, doctors points, Jeff, David, and Armand, and even Lawrence, who you see his face, Lawrence oversees our partnership development and business development for Fathers Incorporated. Um, what we have created is an ecosystem of family, sameness across the board, equal joy, equal pain, a measurement of both of those across the board. And so when we reach out to ask people to get engaged in something that we're doing, they feel like it's part of their responsibility to get engaged. The gift cards and all those things become extra on top of that, but it's not the incentive for them to get involved. They're involved before you even tell. Most of the programs, if not all the programs, and Lawrence, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we don't give any incentives in our programs prior to an individual becoming involved. That's correct. That's correct. We surprise them with the incentive when they're done. When they're done, then we come back and say, oh, thank you so much for doing this 40-week curriculum. We have a gift card for you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being engaged in this. We have a gift card for you. We have an incentive for you. Because our thought about this and to all of their points is that when you get fathers engaged, um, there's a um, quote that says, um, Lamont always used to say this to me, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Once they find out how much you care, they will do more and respect how much you know. And so you always got to come into the space with how much you care for them before you can walk in to the space projecting how much you know. And that there frames what I did when I came to Atlanta wanting to do that conference. I thought that what I knew could get me where I wanted to be. It's taken me seven years to realize that what I know has far less significance in the work that we do than how much people know I care about what it is I'm trying to do for them. And so I know that was a long way around answering that question, but it is part of the work that we have to do in the research space um, as it relates to particularly this community where all kinds of people, we get um, emails all the time from professors around the country and the folks around the country trying to tap into our ecosystem and wanting to get to our dads. And you know what my response to each and every one of them is? No, we're not going to allow and we don't want our fathers to feel like that everyone who wants to poke and prod them will have access to poking and prodding them through this process. We can partner and we could do something that we could do together, but no, we're just not gonna send an email out to our fathers and ship them off to people to ask questions that we don't even have a relationship with, or we don't even know what your in work or what the body of your work looks like. And I think the more we do that around the country in this work where we begin to create um, silos of, of men that include their children and their families and that there's an equal amount of compassion for what they go through, um, that's how long it's going to take for us to really make a true impact in our communities. And so that was, uh, as you say, Jeff, that was me on my soapbox, right? <laughs> um, we got a few minutes. Before we end, I'm trying to scan back. I see you guys are answering questions. There was one other question I wanted you guys to answer. There was a question that someone asked earlier. I asked a question about um, what this work might look like in other urban areas around the country. Um, someone posed a question and asked a question, how much more difficult and what does the work look like in rural areas as it relates to Black fathers? Uh, I'm thinking about that. Um, I would, I just because of some studies I've done looking at um, fathering in another study, and that was again in North Carolina, looking at urban area, a suburban area, and a rural area, um, 
And this was uh, about using barbershops to help um, fathers educate their sons about at-risk sexual behavior. So it was a very, it was a very specific program and, and very specific um, focus of the study, but we wanted to see how we could use barbershops in those areas. And other than, again, kind of geographical location, um, there were not a lot of differences. And I want to reiterate that this study was totally different looking about how fathers educate their sons. So, but I, I don't see a lot of difference in how we interact with in rural populations either. Um, one may um, say that there's there probably not any more community resources uh, to rural African-American fathers as they are, you know, when I say community, uh, non-familial, right? Um, but um, with my research hat on, I, it's certainly a comparative study that we would need to do. Um, but in how fathers relate to sons in the study that I'm talking about, there, there was no difference in um, how they relate, how they talk to their sons and things of that nature based on geographical location or rurality or, urbanis, or urbanization or what have you. Um, and I'm sorry I can't answer that question directly. I'm sitting here, Kenny, trying to think of how we have separated studying fathers based on the yeah, level of rurality. Um, and again, I, I can't answer specifically. For me, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is, as, as you were alluding to, from an economic standpoint, I think that obviously in, in rural areas, there are fewer economic opportunities, right? Um, and, and by definition, they usually fewer support services and resources. Now, we know that there's very little available to fathers, even in urban areas, even places like Atlanta, right? Like that's the point of the study. So, so it may be that there's even less available to folks in, in, in other parts of, of, of the state and in, in more rural places. The, the, the one thing that I think may be potentially an advantage in a rural place, and it gets at this notion that Kenny was just talking about, right? So like in rural places, it may be a little bit easier to develop relationships, particularly if you have some established connections, right? Uh, so if you can get your foot in the door um, with whomever the right people are in a rural place, I think that you you may be well on your way to be able to access whatever may be available there, right? Now, now how much you're going to be able to leverage that is is a different sort of a discussion or conversation. But uh, but I think I think Kenny's story is is I think a, a really really appropriate one because what he talked about was being sort of an outsider, right, and having to sort of w do the work to ingratiate himself with the local people. Well, if you if you are already connected to the 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 local people, then I think that 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 makes it a lot easier. So I'm thinking about specifically with some of the work that we did in rural parts of Kentucky. Once we developed relationships with the uh, um, the folks on the ground there, even people who worked in a county attorney's office, we had several situations where we had guys graduating from our program, and one of our incentives had to do with a, a, a child support forgiveness for arrears owed to the state. Well, once we developed those relationships, having that certificate of completion from our program meant a whole lot more in some of these rural places than it did in the urban areas, right? So there were several instances where the county attorney forgave 100% of the arrears that were owed to the state. And we're talking about guys who graduated from our program, walking to the county attorney's office and essentially being able to exchange their completion uh, certificate of completion for $10,000 worth of arrears forgiveness. You know what I mean? Uh, simply because of the relationship that we had established and built with the county attorney over time. Well, the county attorney here in Jefferson County, um, it was a lot more difficult to do that because first of all, it was a lot more difficult to even establish a sort of a standard meeting and, and get meetings with it because of the volume of cases that they had. So there was so much sort of rigmarole and people were busy doing that thing that it was just tougher. Um, but it was in some, some ways a lot easier in the rural areas. And so that served to sort of balance, not completely balance, but sort of balance the reality that there were fewer economic opportunities available in those places. So it's, so it's equally difficult, but it just looks different. I was also thinking that, um, you know, one of the, uh, when I ran programs in um, the state of New York, 
Uh, we had, I had programs across New York State. And for uh, those of you who have never been outside of New York City, um, New York State is more rural than it is urban, right? And so once you get beyond the borders of New York City, uh, New York State looks just like Georgia, <laughs> with the exception of coal in the winter. And so one of the biggest issues that they had in programs, uh, particularly our rural programs, was transportation and distance um, and the distance between resources, particularly when they did not have the ability to get around. I remember um, during COVID, um, working with some of our dads, uh, one of the biggest issues um, with fathers in um, rural areas, not only as it relates to finding resources, but even going to work, was their forced need to uh, take an Uber back and forth to work. Um, for many of those individuals, Uber was taking 60 to 70 percent of their check just to get to work, right? Which is why many of them just decided to go home. And so, um, transportation becomes a huge issue. And then when you look across some other areas of the country, particularly in the areas of the country where we've worked with the um, indigenous nations and, and Native Americans um, in the Western part of the country, you know, challenges in those communities in um, substance abuses, um, domestic violence, um, alcoholism and those kinds of things where there's not a lot going on and very few things that people can get into and in various ways where people can dull their pain um, in those spaces. And so definitely there is a um, difference between how you provide services um, in both a rural community and an urban community. And it doesn't always have to do with race. Um, it has to do with location. Um, we got a couple of minutes. Um, there was a question that was in the Q&A. I think one of you answered the question about churches, um, but I'm going to collapse that question with another question. I was going to start with you, David, to see if we can squeeze an answer out of you with respect to this question. And that is working with and doing deeper research as it relates to fathers' engagement in the academic lives of their children and research around father engagement and their attachment to their faith. I know those are some two big things, but how do we begin to look at research in those areas? Yeah, and, I, and just really quickly for the sake of time, I put in the chat, um, you know, I really was thinking about this when we thought of, when we're having this conversation about working in rural communities, but I just think that a, a missing partner, if you will, both in terms of research and programming is public schools. And many of the dads uh, that we, uh, that participated in this study talked about um, the school was an anchor. When they found out, the public school was an anchor. When they found out that they were actually gonna be a new dad, that they were able to find unlikely support from a, a public high school that they attended. And so I really think that this is, an, is really an important time to think about re research implications in terms of so many schools have uh, teen dads that nobody knows about, that nobody is talking about. And so being able to capture the voices of those teen dads would be important, as well as um, finding um, strategic partners from the local community that can max out and develop uh, unique fatherhood programs to work with this younger cohort of teenage dads are some things that I think are really timely and important. And on the faith side, what can we do? What kind of research can we do? Is research relevant to talk about father engagement and their attachment to their faith? That's a great question, man. I think I'm going to punt that to somebody else. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble today, so. I, well, I, in regards to, go ahead, Perry. Go ahead, Arma. No, no, I'm just going to say, I'm definitely not the person to talk about, uh, <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I do have, uh, I, but I have studied guys who, who, who use their religion and their faith as a vehicle or a mechanism to remain active in their kids' involvement, uh, and, and I can actually I can actually put a copy of an article in the, in the chat um, so as to preserve our time. Go ahead, Doctor Shear. 
Well, no, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't have any um, thoughts really about the research part, even though I think it would be a great research question to see how those two things are connected. Are people who are more faith-based or religious practicing, are they more involved or whatever? But I just, I just think it would be remiss if we did not identify what a wonderful opportunity that um, faith-based organizations have in doing outreach in their communities, you know, not, and not just bringing, I mean, you know that men learn a lot of fathering through modeling. And so, um, so both faith-based as regards and, and in addition to fraternal organizations and things of that nature, it's just a wonderful opportunity to know that there are men in the community who want to be great dads, who maybe don't have the great models and to begin to offer that part of the outreach. Now, if you want to include that with, with uh, religion and things, that makes sense also, but it, at the very least, it's just a wonderful opportunity for men in religious organizations to engage in outreach, given that there is this pocket of men who want to be better fathers. So, mm, yeah. So there is, um, there's so many um, areas. The research space for responsible fatherhood, and specifically in the area of black fathers, is so wide open. There's so much research that needs to be done. You know, we could spend the rest of a lifetime trying to really dig down, you know, on trying to understand exactly what's going on um, in the lives of black men and black fathers and their families. And certainly we're going to take up that task for as much as we can and as, as our resources allow us to continue to dig in um, to these questions, specifically using for us here, Atlanta as an anchor, um, but exploring our way into other cities and other regions, both urban and rural around the country. I will say this about the um, rural piece. I wrote this down, but I didn't say it. Um, and this is something to just keep in mind. The smaller the jurisdiction, the deeper the need for relationships. The smaller the jurisdiction, the deeper the need for relationships. Because when you get into small towns and when you get into small spaces, everybody knows each other. I know you guys know how that is. And so when you walk into the unemployment office, you're not walking into someone who has a nameplate that you've never seen before in your life. Usually it's somebody you went to school with or somebody your parents or your siblings went to school with, possibly even dated. So you got some emotional history attached to the people that's actually providing public services for you, right? And so being able to create relationships um, with folks that are connected to resource are critical um, for those of you who are providing um services for dads um, in those areas. I want to bring back up my screen because I want to share with you a couple of things before we um, bounce out of here. And that is uh, we have a um, awareness video as it relates to legitimation. Legitimation has become huge um, in our space. Um, and most people don't know about and are totally unaware about legitimation and how that impacts specifically fathers in Atlanta. Um, we did a, we did some research and we went through all of the um, um, reports for the last ten years to determine how many unmarried um, children have been, been have been born in the state of Georgia. Um, since 2010, and we learned that close to 560, a little over 560,000 children have been born in Atlanta to out of wedlock births, which means that their fathers are unlegitimized. It means a host of different things, and it, exacerbate, it is exacerbated, particularly with Black fathers, right? And so take this on for just a lingering thought, and we might come back and do a webinar just so we can kind of dig a little deeper into this specific conversation because it does have a lot of ramifications on the connection that our fathers have with their children. Because these fathers, fathers whose children are not legitimated, have no legal access to their children, they have no legal um, access to things like their health records, their education records, um, um, uh, choices around where to go to school, where to go to church, um, discipline, you know, all of those kinds of things um, they don't have access to. But think about the amount of money um, that is poured into across the state 
providing services to non-custodial parents in Georgia to be more active in the lives of their children in a state that at the same time gives them no legal access to their children. So you're talking to fathers about paying child support, visiting their children, engaging in their children who do not have a say in important and critical issues attached to their children. And that is a legal process, which means that when it's attached to a legal process, that it takes an attorney and money to get through the process if it is a contested um, uh, contested legitimation case. And so we could talk more about that, but take the 30 minutes to watch this video. If you go to fatherhoodisbrotherhood.com, that video is on the front page. It's in one of the panels um, at the top and learn more about that. The second thing I want to point your attention to is we have other uh, resources that we've created um, in the last year or so. Uh, make sure that you go to fathersincorporated.com to download our reports. Um, the blueprint that we did, reimagining the narrative of the modern Black father. Um, thanks to Redefine Ed, our first issue brief on fathers, social justice, and youth educational outcomes. If you want to learn more about the Moynihan Institute for Fatherhood Research and Policy, you can download our project synopsis and really learn a little more in depth about our reasoning and what it is we're trying to accomplish uh, within MI. And then lastly, coming up next month, um, we're going to be releasing our newest um, issue brief, which is going to be on health, mental health matters, why Black dads, positive mental health is good for youth academic outcomes. And so that's our work. And so we're going to continue to do the direct work, the capacity building work, the connection work, the networking work, continue to build our relationships with our great partners um, and to um, just continue to stay focused on creating the best and most healthy environments um, for dads, um, our moms, and our children. And so I will leave this now up to um, Dr. Jeff, uh, Lawrence, David, and, and um, Armand to leave final third thoughts. Um, and then we'll see you. You will be getting an email from us that will include this particular PowerPoint, possibly even a copy of the report itself, as well as the survey for today's webinar. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I'll leave the last words to my brothers. Yeah, so um, I appreciate everybody joining us on the call today. And I just want to, I think I'll again be remiss if we didn't talk about the historical relevance of this work in that um, when I started doing father work 20 years ago, we didn't have any studies that even asked. There were no studies about father in particular about not black. It wasn't about black fathers or low income fathers. And so um, for me personally, uh, starting this work 20 years ago, we didn't even have measures of fathering. And uh, most of the studies about fathers asked moms what dads did for us to really be digging down now into what the experience of African-American fathers in low-income communities in, in a specific Atlanta and low-income community, man, is, just does my heart good. So I want to just put this in historical, um, in historical context that we've come a long way. And as people have articulated in the chat here, we have a long way to go to start changing systems, start changing perceptions, and really offering these men support to be the dads and better dads uh, that they really desire to be. But I recognize we've come a long way as a society in recognizing the importance of fathers in the lives of children. Um, and I'll share this last thought. I, I often, as a social worker, as a practice social worker, I have to remind people, children, uh, uh, I have to remind social workers, people that every child has a father. Every child has a father. And if we're going to really uh, do things to care for children, we need to have fathers engaged. So uh, again, Kenny, thank you for your work. Uh, Lawrence, David, Perry, um, I appreciate you working with you guys and just excited to continue to, to uplift fathers together. Feel free to share your final thoughts, David, Armand, Lawrence. Yeah, just super quickly, shout out to Kenny Braswell and the team at Fathers Incorporated for always being um, intentional and, and cutting edge. For you know, two decades, I was on the practitioner side, really working in communities 
you know, with uh, low-income Black fathers now um, moved over also to the research side. And it's definitely been a, a very interesting um, journey. My research is focused on Black fathers raising daughters. And so I will tell you, there's a lot of work um, still in front of us. And I think it's really important that we begin to think about the kinds of uh, strategic partnerships and collaborations that we can enter into to make sure that we can begin to move a strengths-based agenda. Uh, too often, I've, I've struggled uh, reading and combing over all of these studies that look at Black fathers through a deficit lens. And so again, I think that we have a lot of work um, ahead of us, and there are a lot of dads in communities that don't even know we exist that are counting on us. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that um, being a father is the highest calling that a man can have here on earth. And so I think we all know how important this work is, given that uh, we have an increasing number of expectations for dads. I think it's uh, it's only right. It's only fair that we also show up with an equal amount of resources and support so that they can fulfill their obligations and, and act on their intentions to take active roles in our kids life. And that's what sort of grounds and centers my work. And I think the same can be said for the whole crew on this panel. So we appreciate you all coming out to listen and, and share your perspectives and engage us in the chat and the dialogue. Uh, it, it, it's, it is encouraging to know that uh, there's so many people interested in these topics because we know there's a lot of work to be done and it's gonna take a critical mass in order to get it done. So we really appreciate that. And I'll just say briefly, I wanna thank the, uh, the researchers, the fellows, um, for your contribution and, uh, and your expertise um, to pulling together this report. Um, um, thank again, uh, Kenny mentioned before, the Annie Casey Foundation for um, allow, you know, allowing and, and giving us uh, money and seed money to make sure that this, this research could go forward. And then uh, thanks to the, the every everyone that attended today, make sure you fill out when you receive the survey, we'll ask you to complete the survey um, to let us uh, know how well we did or uh, areas of improvement, um, because what we wanna do is continue to offer these type of opportunities to folks. And then lastly, I wanna thank Kenny for his leadership and, um, and for always, uh, making sure that the that men fathers are at the forefront of this conversation um, and allowing us to be able to be brave and take a risk and asking some hard questions uh, when we're walking into spaces uh, where fathers are not always celebrated. So thank you for for all of that. And we look forward to, to continuing these type of dialogues uh, going forward. And thank you for uh, just, just hanging in there with us throughout uh, the last hour and a half.